Good morning. Good morning. Let us sing our congregational call to worship, Victory in Jesus. Let us stand and sing together. You be seated. Welcome to our 1030 service of worship. We are so glad that you're here. If you're tuning in with us, thank you for that. If you're visitors here this morning, we appreciate you being here. We ask, if you would please, to fill out the visitor registration form that's located in the pew rack in front of you. If you don't mind filling that out and turning that in during the offertory, we would really appreciate that. I have one quick announcement to make to you. Kids Night In is this Friday night. If your child is interested in that, please sign up to Miss Rachel by Thursday. We hope that they will come out for that. Always lots of fun. Elizabeth Jordan is going to have a few things to say, then followed by Steve Maddox. Early this morning, he, at 8.30, he said I had something to announce. I said, oh, no, 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 no. I have lots of things. So with that being said, 
Starting this Tuesday at 545 in the Fellowship Hall, a newly formed visitation team will be meeting. They're going to go out in teams of two to visit any of our visitors that would like a visit, to learn more about our church, for prayer, just whatever their needs may be. Um, as well as if a church member would like a visit with someone just for prayer or just someone to chit chat, they welcome that as well. So if for more information, you can meet in the parlor today immediately after the service. They're going to be having a planning meeting. Um, it is headed up at this time by Amy Russell, Pam Harness, and Bob and Lee Hum. So another great opportunity if you would like to share about our church, um, your own personal walk with Jesus, or if somebody would just like prayer. And then, speaking of visitors, um, there will be several of us in the front of the church after the service. If you are a first, second time visitor and would like to um, be the recipient of a homemade loaf of strawberry bread, we would love to share that with you and hopefully maybe gather some more information about you. So, in case you're not aware, tomorrow is Valentine's Day and the Joy Group, Just Older Youth, has planned a great evening with a meal catered by Halyards and Entertainment by Michael Hewlett. If you have not picked up your tickets yet, um, you can see me after church and I'll be glad to exchange tickets for any money because I'd rather not take up money tomorrow night. So, or you can come to the office tomorrow. That'd be fine too. So, all right. So then we have another, <laughs> you know, Joy, just because we're over 55 does not mean that we are sitting home twirling our thumbs. So, we planned another event, Beware of the Odds of March. So on March 17th at noon in the Fellowship Hall, Annie Akins, and I'm sure you all are all familiar with her, she will be entertaining us as well as we'll be having a meal of Irish flair. So please call the church office to reserve your spot. And don't worry, I will remind you several times between now and then. This is a fun, free event, and we welcome anyone to come join us on March 17th at noon for lunch and Annie. You're always a tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, my name is Steve Maddox, and I'm uh, one of the members of the Preschool Advisory Committee. Uh, you know, we have an award-winning preschool just down the hall. We have two wonderful, wonderful leaders, uh, Ellie and Allie, I mean, Alicia and Ellie. And uh, we are coming before the congregation today asking for your help. Uh, as you know, during the uh, difficult time with uh, COVID and everything, uh, uh, staffing has been a problem, so we're reaching out for volunteers within our church to help out in some of the times that uh, are a little busier than usual during the day. So if you're an early riser, uh, 7 to 9 a.m. in the morning, which is a drop-off where the parents drop the kids off, you get them into the school, uh, two hours there. We're talking uh, 12.30 to 2.30 when the staff is uh, uh, breaking for lunch. Uh, also from 3 to 5, which is pickup. Same thing, also a little help in the kitchen for the kids. So if you feel inclined, if God leads you to uh, spend a couple of hours or we'll take as many hours in the day that you'll give us, uh, we would certainly appreciate your help uh, down with the, uh, the preschool. Um, so after the service, 10.30, uh, Alicia will be in the uh, uh, Welcome Center right outside the door if you've got questions. Also, if you can't meet with her today, her uh, name and information is on the bulletin, so you can look on the bulletin to get information there. Uh, so any, any help on that in any capacity would be greatly appreciated. So really want you to pray about it and uh, look forward to seeing some of you there. Also another note, as a lot of you know, Ellie Moser, uh, her last day will be on Thursday. Uh, she's pursuing another endeavor that we're really excited about. She's excited about it and wish her all the best. She's been an incredible addition to the staff at the preschool, uh, her dedication, her hard work. So. Uh, just want to say if you want to say thank you to her or if you feel led in any way to drop a love offering off at the church office that would be much appreciated too so thank you very much and god bless thank you steve and now let us sing our doxology and remain standing for our prayer
I invite you to follow along on the screen or look into your bulletin as we begin our time of prayer by reciting the prayer of indifference together. Let us pray. I am indifferent to anything but God's will. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Lord God, creator and sustainer of all things, that is our prayer. Move us out of the way so that we might experience more of you. God, we want to love and chase after you with all of our hearts. God, we ask that we might know your will so that we might follow it quickly and passionately. And God, we know that when we focus on you, that you work in and through us to bring your kingdom in our lives and on earth as it is in heaven. Help us to remember that when your son Jesus came, he turned the world upside down. And in him and him alone, we find victory and salvation. And by living his way, we find the path to life. Use this time of worship to change and mold us more deeply into the image of your son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you to follow along on the screen or open your Bibles to our scripture reading this morning. It comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, and we'll be reading from verses 17 through 26. Luke, chapter 6, 17 through 26. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him, because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven." For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. May we reflect upon God's word together.
Let's continue to sing together our worship melody on Jordan's stormy banks. Come thou fount of every blessing, the other version. Let us stand and sing together.
Let us pray. Our God and Father, again, we do thank you for another day giving us your son of us. We thank you, Father, for this time we come here together to your house, Father, to hear your word. And Father, we just pray, Father, these offerings we're about to take today, that you'll just multiply them and use them for your kingdom here and around the world now. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Okay, I know that some of you have a wonderful friend who gave you a Valentine gift, and it's a little toy, so I'm going to ask you to put that little toy in your pocket. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so have you ever had a day that just feels like the worst day ever? Oh, you know what I'm talking about. I don't even have to give you any examples. You maybe you didn't sleep well, and then you wake up late, and then you step in gum, you miss the bus, maybe the dog had made a mess on the rug. 
I mean, it's just really every everything just seems to goes wrong. You get to school, or for those of you who are homeschooled, maybe you have trouble concentrating. And then your teacher or your mom thinks that you're doing it on purpose and you get in trouble. And then maybe people are mean to you for no reason. You didn't do anything. Why are they being mean? And then just things just keep going wrong. Anybody ever had a day like that? Yeah. Yeah, everybody's raising their hands. Yeah, me, me too, me too. Well, guess what? Jesus understands this. Jesus knows that we're, we have bad days. And I hate to tell you this. I hate to tell you the bad news, but you're going to have more bad days. I know. I know. It's just, it's part of being human. It's part of being human. Yeah, we are mammals. Science, science fact. So, so, but the thing is that, you know, bad things can happen to us whether, whether we deserve it or not, right? It just happens. But, so the Bible says, uh, Jesus says that, uh, that we are blessed, though, that blessed are the ones who are poor, because theirs is the kingdom of God. And blessed the, those of you who are hungry, because you will be satisfied. You will be full. And blessed are those of you who are crying, who are weeping, because later you will laugh. What? It doesn't make any sense. And then blessed when people hate you. I know. How is that a blessing? That's a good question. Because, and then it says, it goes on, Jesus goes on to say, um, even to rejoice in, rejoice in that day and leap for joy because your reward will be great in heaven. So what, what in the world does that mean? So I like to think of it like on some of those days when we have bad days, it's easy. We do feel frustrated and sad and mad. And it's okay to feel those things. Because again, those are human emotions and those bad days are part of being human. But God tells us that God is with us. And on some days, it feels like enough hope just to know that God is with us. But on some days, it maybe isn't enough to know just that God is with us. Maybe we need a little bit more hope than that. So on those days, Jesus, we know that Jesus is with us, but Jesus is there to offer us some kind of a blessing. Because in those moments is when we know that we need God. And we need God all the time, even on the good days, we need God But it's in those moments when we're having a really bad day is when we feel like we need God the most. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, you get it. You're smart. So we can, when we can receive God's help, that's when we can have some hope because God is the one who can give us hope. So when we, when we pray in a little bit, we're going to do something different today. You ready for a different kind of prayer? Hmm. So I'm going to say a line of a, of a prayer. We're going to pray together. I'm going to say it, and then you're going to re- repeat it back after me instead of me just praying for us. We're going to pray together. Okay, so I'm going to say it, then you're going to say it back. Repeat. Okay, you're ready. All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for Jesus, who shows us how to receive your help and direction, so that we know, even on our worst days, that you are with us. Thank you and amen. Thank you, amen. Okay, thank you, my friends. Please line up and wait at the Welcome Center.
If I may, I would like to offer a word. I want to offer a word, and I hope that when you hear it, an image will come to your mind. And I hope you'll hang on to that image for just a moment. The word? Blessed. Blessed. What image came to your mind? Was it the first time that you held your new grandchild and you felt blessed? Was it that last gathering when everyone was able to be in one place all gathered around the table and you had that moment of gratitude blessed? Maybe it's what you experience every day when you walk into your office and you remind yourselves how grateful you are to be able to provide and you know that you are blessed. Or maybe it will happen tonight when you sit down in your easy chair and you realize you have a roof over your head and a place to sleep. You are blessed. Now, I don't want to change any of those images. As a matter of fact, I do know that most of us equate blessing with those good things that we have in our life. And as a matter of fact, a few months ago, we were having a conversation on the book of James, and James says, every good and perfect gift comes down from God, the Father of lights. We know that the good things that happen in our lives are, in fact, a gift from God. But we come to this passage of Scripture this morning, and it may be that in encountering Jesus, we may have an opportunity to have a more robust, full definition of what it means to be blessed. But as important as it is in what Jesus says, as important as it is how Jesus says it, for the gospel writer Luke, it's equally important where Jesus offers these words. Of course, most of you, when you heard Justin read them, knew that this was a portion of Jesus' sermon. It's also in the book of Matthew. It's the Sermon on the Mount. And, of course, that's where we expect God to do remarkable things, right? As far back as Moses, Moses goes up on the mountaintop and God then gives the Ten Commands. Mountains are where we expect God to work. It's an authoritative place from which we can hear a word from God and then we can go down and bring that word to God's people. But Luke is equally emphatic that this sermon that Jesus preached, this conversation that Jesus had did not happen on the mountaintop. But Luke is very clear to say that it happened in a flat place. Many years ago, I was an adjunct professor of preaching at a small Baptist school in Texas. What that means is they pay you very little and they don't allow you to pick out your own textbook. So... I had to teach this preaching class with this textbook that I'm quite certain the first edition was with a hammer and chisel. I mean, it was ancient. And, but there was one interesting section that the author had that I will never forget, and it was about you, the listener. For whatever reason and whatever ability, this author said that you can know a lot about a person in the congregation by where they sit in the sanctuary. And oh, the things he had to say about you folk in the back. <laughs> and he would go through and talk about the different kinds of personalities that lead you to sit where you sit. But one thing, one thing he didn't get to, 
in his textbook is about the location of the preacher. Sometimes the preacher stands behind the pulpit and there's this sense of authority and thus saith the Lord. Sometimes the preacher paces back and forth for no other reason than he had too much coffee on the drive from Jacksonville. (laughs) But sometimes the preacher can get closer to you and it becomes more of a conversation in an intimate space. Luke is very clear to say that Jesus preaches this sermon in conversation with his disciples and with a group of people that were gathering around him. And if you are like me, you hear these words and they are challenging to say the least. Now, in a few months you are going to call a new pastor to serve this wonderful congregation. And if this pastor does in fact preach this Jesus, there are going to be some difficult conversations that you're going to have. And while you as a congregation must bless your pastor in having those conversations, your pastor in turn should be a good steward of how those conversations happen. I had the wonderful opportunity for 14 years to be the pastor of the Hendricks Avenue Baptist Church in Jacksonville. It was one of those places where I could be who I was and felt like I added value to that place. And it's an open-minded place. You can say anything, but you better keep in mind where you say it. In the pulpit is one-way communication. And for a bunch of Baptists, when you're talking about difficult things, that doesn't always sit well. But when you're around a table, having a conversation, and you can authentically share how you believe the Spirit of God is at work, and the congregation can authentically speak back and say, you are wrong, it makes a difference because you're in this together. Luke is very clear that Jesus has this conversation not on a mountain, but on a level place. And his disciples are gathered around him because we know in the ministry of Jesus and certainly in the gospel of Luke, what Jesus is doing is preparing his disciples to go to Jerusalem. And so in Luke chapter 9 verse 51, that's when Jesus sets his face to go toward Jerusalem. And Jesus is trying to prepare them and us to live in a world as Jesus sees it. Because the disciples at this moment and what they will find in Jerusalem, and I would suggest what many of us consider to be blessed, has roots all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy. You remember the children of Israel are about to cross over into the promised land. And so Moses gives this really, really, really long sermon that basically boils down to when you get into the land of promise, if you do what God says, God's going to bless you. When you get into the land of promise, if you don't do what God says, God will not bless you. And that is certainly a narrative that is woven through the Hebrew Bible. Uh, The exile happens and prophets come and say, there's a reason this happened. We didn't do what God wants us to do. And I could pause right now, I'm sure. And if you had the courage, you could stand up and tell a story of, yes, in fact, I did something that I knew God didn't want me to do and it didn't turn out so well. That is a part of the journey of faith. But that's not the only narrative that we find in Scripture. It's not the only narrative even woven through the Hebrew Bible. One of my best friends in my time in Jacksonville was the senior rabbi at the temple. And he and I would have these great conversations. And we would talk about what I referenced, this Deuteronomic theology. Do what you should, God will bless you. And he said that's certainly a part of Hebrew Scripture. But he said, there's also a book called Job. You remember that? Job is just living his best life, doing what he wanted to do, his kids, his family. And all of a sudden, the tempter comes and begins to take things, these things away. My friend Rabbi Leaf said, Job is a response to Deuteronomic theology. 
that it's not quite so simple as do what God tells you to, and then you will be, in some definitions, blessed. Jesus is asking us to rethink that because he's shaping us to live in his world rather than our own. Jesus is going to encounter disciples who look at someone who is sick, and they say, who sinned, that person or his parents? And Jesus has the audacity to say in this conversation, blessed are you when you're poor, when you're hungry, and when you cry. I won't ask you, but how many of you conjured up an image of difficulty, tears, poverty, or hunger when I mentioned the word blessed? Probably not many. But why is it that Jesus wants us to expand our definition of what this word means? Well, I think first of all, Jesus wants to expand our definition because, as Rachel so eloquently pointed out in the children's sermon, life happens. And when struggle comes, if we do not have a more full understanding of what it means to be blessed, we begin to ask ourselves all the wrong questions. What have I done wrong and why is God doing this to me? Which is unsatisfactory at best. But I think more damaging is not when we do it to ourselves, but when we want to do it to others. Oh, you're poor? What'd you do or didn't do? Oh, you're hungry? Oh, you're weeping? Well, maybe if you would get your act together, implied like I do, those things wouldn't be happening. But here is Jesus saying, take another look at this. Blessed are you when you are poor, when you are hungry, when you are mourning. What is that about? For several years, I was privileged to be the pastor of Bill Crawford. Bill was just a blue-collar, salt-of-the-earth person that worked his entire career at the electric company. And Bill had, in that little church, the best job you could have. He was the Sunday school secretary. Some of you know what that job entailed. It meant that you sat at a little desk next to the coffee pot and that Sunday school classes would bring their records to you and you could find out every gossip of every Sunday school room in the entire church. It was a great, great job. And then you got to go into the sanctuary before everyone else and get that back seat that everyone wanted. Bill had a story of his time with the electric company. He told it to me, I don't know how many times, but I remember the first time he said, he said, you know, I was, I was working and, and we were, I was climbing a pole and he said, there was a horrible accident. I can't remember if he fell off the pole or if the pole fell with him. Whatever happened, it was awful. And so he told me that story and he talked about being rushed to the hospital in the weeks that he stayed there. And I said, Bill, that is terrible. He said, well, yes. He said, my body still aches and hurts because of that accident. But he said, it was also one of the best things that ever happened to me. I said, how so? He said, well, at that time, I thought I was all the stuff. And I would come home, and I would drink myself silly, and I would be mean to my kids, and my wife was barely hanging on being married to me. And he said, I'll tell you something, preacher. When you're laying flat on your back in a hospital bed, you have a lot of time to think. And he said, I think that that was an opportunity that happened to me that God used to let me get right with God. And I have never, ever, ever turned back to who I was before that day. And I got myself down to the church. I gave my life to Jesus and I got baptized. And while I still hurt from that accident, it was also one of the very best things that could ever happen to me. I think Bill, if he were here today, would say, as difficult as that moment was, 
He was blessed. Because in our weakness, we are more open to that which is central to the gospel of Jesus. And that is that God in Christ did for us what we cannot do for ourselves. We are all people in need. And sometimes when our physical need matches our spiritual need, we are closer to opening ourselves up from help that comes from outside ourselves. And that's why Jesus then goes on to say, Woe to you who are full now. Woe to you who, are la- who laugh now. Woe to you who are rich now. Not in and of itself because those things are bad, but more so is that in our wealth, in our fullness, in our comfort, we can be more apt to forget our need. A need that only God in Christ provides for us. I want to offer you a word. And when I offer it, I suspect there will be an image that comes into your mind. The word is blessed. And I hope in contrast to the image that you had a few moments ago. That at least... Around the edges, the picture is a little bit fuzzy. I hope that as you have that image of blessedness in your mind, that you'll at least say, but Jesus. And you will give that not only to yourself, but the person with whom you encounter. I close quoting the great philosopher of our day, Ted Lasso. (laughs) I love the scene where Ted is about to enter into a dart match with the evil, self-absorbed Rupert. And it's going to become a high-stakes dart match. And so Rupert is throwing the dart, hitting the bullseye every time. And Ted takes the invitation and enters into this contest. And he says, you know... People have miscounted, misunderstood me all my life. And he said, I used to think the problem was with me. But he said, now I've learned the problem is not with me. It's with them. Because they were not curious. The poor the hungry, the hurting. It's one thing to experience ourselves. But it is another thing altogether to be curious about those that we see, that we meet, that we know. And can we find together this whole notion of blessing? Pray with me, please. Thank you, Lord, for the words of Scripture. Thank you that we are people in process. We are today what we were not yesterday. We are growing in what it means to know and love you, to know and love and serve this community. God, we do not dare believe that the circumstances to which Jesus speaks are easy. And yet we know that in all circumstances, we can and know your grace, your love, and your presence. So wherever we are this morning, we ask that we would know your blessing. Not just for ourselves, but so that we can give witness to when we were in pain, when we hurt, when we were poor, when we were hungry, we found strength from outside of ourselves. May we embrace that gift in this place and in Christ's name. Amen. And we proclaim Jesus Christ and him crucified that Friday when it seemed as though he was cursed only to experience the blessing of Easter morning. 
And we invite you to follow him. Perhaps you will say yes to Christ's invitation. Perhaps you feel led by God's spirit to be a part of this wonderful congregation as it seeks to minister in this community and in this world that God loves. We're going to celebrate decisions that are made. Justin will be here in the front as we stand together and sing this morning. This is one of those remarkable Sundays where there are multiple invitations, and we hope that you will say yes. If you're a guest, please take advantage of that invitation to meet wonderful church members and enjoy some homemade strawberry bread. If you're a member of First Baptist, please say yes to that invitation and get to that welcome center and support your preschool. Every church that the Center for Healthy Churches works with says, we want to reach young families. It's the mantra of every congregation I know. Well, you're reaching them, and they need to know how wonderful you are. So I hope you'll say yes to volunteer. Alicia will be there. But however you respond to these invitations, hear a word of benediction now from the book of Hebrews. And now, may the God of peace who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. Make you complete in everything good, so that you may do his will, working among us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.